Tommy V in Michigan. He was on fire this morning. Hey, thank you, Tommy V in Michigan. Th that, yes, sir. If you, if you share my prayers. Mm -hmm. my Tommy V's on. Yeah, we'll jump over there. Tommy V doing great stuff over there. Court calls the case, people, state of Michigan versus Michael Kyle. Assistant prosecuting attorney, Mark Gross, on behalf of the people. <laughs> and Matthew Mansour, assistant public defender, with and on behalf of Mr. Kyle, who appears to my left. Mr. Kyle, can you state your name for the record, please? Michael Kyle. All right. He can have a seat because. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Let me go ahead, Mr. Gross. Your Honor, I primarily am going to be relying on the motion. I do just want to note. After having received a review defense's response, there seems to be two focuses there. One, that Mr. Kyle did not engage in any actual wrongdoing, and two, that any potential wrongdoing that may or may not have happened did not actually lead to the victim failing to appear. There was one statement in the first call where the grandmother had patched in the victim where she said specifically, I know, and I didn't, I still don't think there was a reason to put your hands on somebody, though. And Mr. Kyle responds back, I didn't put my hands on you like that. And if I did, I apologize. I, to me, this is really the heart of the issue, is that he is persistent and consistent in telling her that she needs to call and tell them that nothing happened and that he didn't choke her. And this is the statement where she says, no matter what, that's not a reason to put your hands on somebody. And he says, I didn't. And if I did, I'm sorry. That's the heart of this. And if we're talking about wrongdoing, the content of this call is a continuation of the wrongdoing that we see in the initial incident where he takes the phone from the victim and keeps her from calling 911 to call his grandmother where she tells him not to call. She tells the victim not to call 911. This is a pattern of behavior that we're seeing continue on after his arrest and arraignment. But isn't there even a more um, concrete statement where there's an indication where the defendant is talking to the grandmother about communicating to the victim to change her story? Correct. And I think that that goes beyond the direct contact between the defendant and the victim, and it relates to ongoing contact that has continued outside of the jail between the defendant's family and the victim. She is so in fear that she did not appear for preliminary exam, and I am concerned that she won't appear again, which is why we filed this motion, because of the defendant's persistence and pattern of behavior exhibited and the initial incident, and then continuing in the calls. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. And thank you for allowing uh, us to have this hearing. Uh, my objective today is to show this court that the people cannot establish their burden even by a preponderance of the evidence. Uh, just to clarify what the people have just mentioned on the statement that was just said about regarding putting their hands on someone. Your Honor, we're here for a forfeiture of wrongdoing motion. And if we finish that, the context of that statement, he also said, I did not, and if I did. So I just wanted to put that before I forget. Uh, I, I believe all three elements are in our favor. And I will use the standards set forth in. Even if done through a third party? Your Honor, I, I will address that. No, I, you will address what I ask you to address, even if through a third party? 
even if through a third party, the elements? If, if there is a statement made by the defendant to a relative, I believe a grandmother in this case, or her, his mother, um, indicating between the two of them to tell the victim to change her story. And then an acknowledgement that somebody will. Why isn't that a wrongdoing? Your Honor, that will go towards <clears throat> the clarity, the intent, and the purpose behind why to change her statement. There, and I was going to go through this element by element. And that is that question, the, the best response to that question is if you re, if you go through the jail calls, which I'm sure you have, if you go through the jail calls, there is, I'll just go through them uh, now. In the jail call on March 26, 2024, uh, in the motions at 8.25.55, Mr. Kyle called his grandmother, all right, and Ms. Lazarski. And if you look at the jail call at 3.05 into the jail call, so did you tell them I choked you? This is a question towards the complaining witness. Ms. Lazarski stated, I didn't say anything to them. Okay, at this point, there's confusion. There's mixed testimony that we are trying to clear up. Mr. Kyle then followed, Ken, can you call up there and change your statement? Can you call up there and change your statement? Because, uh, because all, I'm sorry, because they are saying that, they are saying that. Then she responds, I'll call them and talk to them. So her intent is clear. Okay, and then grandma responds, they hear everything on this phone. So they are, and when you make phone calls from jail, we all know it says this is a recorded line. Mr. Kyle responds that, that it's not about them. They told me, you said that I choked you. They're telling me that you're saying I choked you. She responds again, I'll call up there and talk to them. Mr. Kyle says, is that what you're trying to do? Question. Or do you just want me to leave you alone? Question. I get out. Is that what it is? Four questions. Answer to that question is, Your Honor, he's not calling his grandma to say, oh, fix her statement because she, uh, her, her statement is uh, concrete. Because what Miss Lazarski is telling him is she's saying this never happened. I never told, told them any of this. So, and I, I, Highlighted in another call. On March 26th, the day before the arraignment, at 1839.58, at nine minutes and 47 seconds into that call, Mr. Kyle asks her, you said you had said what? And Ms. Lazarski replied, That's not, that it's not how it went and that I wasn't. And I didn't say any of that and that I didn't want to press charges or move forward. Mr. Kyle replied, and I love the Mr. Kyle replied, I mean, if that's how you feel, then of course, go along with it. But you know, when I talk to you, here we go. It's completely different from what they are saying. So that is my response to th that why wouldn't that manifest an intent of some type? I mean, if what you're indicating to me is I'm supposed to garner some intent that it has to be something direct. I mean, why is he involved at all in the changing of what allegedly is said. Why is he doing that at all? That's a, 
That's a great question, Your Honor. It is. And thank you for bringing that up. And the the response to that would be, Mr. Kyle is facing potential felony charges. He has not been arraigned yet. He wants to know exactly what's going on with what the police report saying, what the complaining witness is saying. Again, there the no contact is not set in place. So Mr. Kyle's liberty is at stake. So I I don't see it to be unreasonable for a situation like what Mr. Kyle and the complaining witness have gone through allegedly uh, for Mr. Kyle to call immediately on the mother of his child, the complaining witness, to clarify what is going on. But he goes beyond just what is going on. Doesn't he? I res I respectfully disagree. I don't think it goes beyond what is going on. He's he calls her and says, well, what's going on? This is what I hear. This is what you hear. Okay. But he does more than that. Doesn't he? Your Honor, if I may. Yes, go ahead. He goes beyond asking for clarification. He makes explicit statements. He says to his grandmother, can you call her? I need her to change her statement. That's not a, can you ask her what happened? Can you ask her how she felt? Can you tell me what is going on? He says, can you call her though and tell her I'm on the phone so she can change my statement and I don't have to go through with felonies because I'm not even going to get out of jail until tomorrow. That's not a, can you tell me more or what's going on? I'm confused. That is explicit and direct and with intention. And it is ex exceedingly clear that this is a manipulation of the victim. If that's how you feel, then go along with it. You, you are telling me you did not say any of that. So this isn't a, oh, well, go up to, let me call grandma and tell her to fix the statement. Fix your statement in regards to the truth is what's going on. Uh, if you are telling me you did not say that, but the police are saying you said that, then just tell the truth. Counsel, by your argument, the court would never, well, would rarely be able to find that there's any intent to do anything other than try to clarify. Because I, I mean, it seems to me the argument you're making is that it can't be the context or the sort of totality of all that's being said into maybe said to various parties regarding this to express some intent of the defendant regarding this particular case. But that I, as I hear your argument, it almost has to be some express statement on his part. Your Honor, I the court to find that there's intent. Your Honor, I believe, if I may, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I believe there there needs to be, and I've I've sat in on a motion, uh, forfeiture motion hearing in this honorable court uh, just last week, and I loved the court's analysis because it took the context of the call of that jail call. And, and obviously this is completely different facts, different circumstances, but it, the court in its analysis almost made a spectrum of the context of the jail calls. It was the spectrum almost being don't show up. And if so, lie. And this was a this was another case not has to do with this. This case here that we're here for, I believe, is almost opposite of that. And that don't show up and lie is egregious. It's undue influence. It's manipulation. It's obstruction. It's pressure. But what do, what would be the ramifications if she doesn't change her story? Your Honor, that's 
something for the court. No, 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 no. I'm saying as between the two of them, what would be the ramifications of her not changing her story? Well, Your Honor, technically she did change her story. She called up here. Okay. So, I, you know, if, if we're going by the police report, correct. The, the ramifications of her not changing her story is detrimental. But, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and I'm, but if we're going off of her statement after this alleged do you what I hear you saying is is that and all of these are very different in terms of what is said is that somehow or another it has to be so direct that there can't be sort of this manifest one couldn't conclude that there's some intent to not have this person testify or to have them even testify falsely. Your Honor, I believe it's the intent for the complaining witness not to testify or if to testify, testify falsely or make the witness, make the complaining witness unavailable whatsoever to the court. Ms. Lazarski, the complaining witness, has, I, I don't know how much clear she could make it, uh, uh, she could state it uh, in the jail calls. I don't. It's, I, there. Yeah. She, I mean, what he wants is he wants it to go away. He doesn't want to face the felony charges. He says that, right? And that's well, no, that's what he says, right? Of course, yeah. And then says, You need, in essence, you need to change your story so that that doesn't happen, right? I don't know. Well, you, what do you know? I mean, what do you mean you don't know? No, I'm not saying I don't, I don't agree with that, Your Honor. What is, what do you think he's saying then? I'm, what, what I'm saying is he is trying to have her testify to the truth. If she is telling, Your Honor, if somebody's telling me something. Yeah. Then why even bring up the felony charges? Because he's facing felonies, Your Honor. But he says, I don't want to face the felony charge. I don't want to be here on a felony. Why do you think he says that? Your Honor, that's what I'm sure many people would say. Why do you think? This defendant said that in the context of what else he was saying. Because he's saying this because she is telling him that is not what went down. That is not what is said. So why are they saying, why are, why does the police report say that it does say this? Because now I'm facing felony charges. Is that really what you think he said? Your Honor, if I may, it's not just that I want these felony charges to go away. It's beyond that. It's if they don't go away, I'm going to be here for a really long time. I'm not going to be able to talk to you or our kid. I'm not going to be able to be around. It's holding over not just the bad, but also the good. But then you have in the back of the victim's mind the fact that she just got strangled. And so you're dangling a carrot and the potential of the negative as well. And he's very explicit about the potential consequences. I'm looking at felonies. If you don't change your story, you want me to leave you alone or they probably won't no, like I'm going to have to stay in here until my court date weeks, months, however long. And if we're talking about him wanting to get to the truth, when she says explicitly, I still don't think there's a reason to put your hands on somebody. 
that is a candid statement that she made. And he discounts that. He immediately says no. She tells him the truth. He makes an unsolicited, excited utterance that he put it, that he put his hands on her. And he immediately brushes that aside because it's not what he wanted to hear in that moment. It's not what he wanted to have said on the recorded line. And when he's faced with the truth, he goes right back down the line of dangling the carrot. If you change your story, I'm going to get out soon, not in weeks, months, however long. Mr. Ram Mr. Let them know that I never put my hands on you. Which Mr. Ramsor. Yes, Your Honor. You talked about this spectrum that the court had brought up in the other. Yes. Why are you saying this one falls closer to the other end? Your Honor, I'm saying that because he's not, I don't, to my knowledge, he has not said one time, don't show up to court. Okay. Then. But it doesn't always come through that way. Okay. That's correct, Your Honor. That's correct. Also, he's telling her to testify to what the truth is. Your Honor, this, I. He's telling her to change her story and say that. Right? Your Honor, she is. I mean. She is saying that. That's, that is not how it went. And that I wasn't. And quote, unquote, this is her saying this. I didn't say any of that. What do you expect her to say? The truth to a police officer? No, no, no. To him. What do you expect her to say? Your Honor, this is the same complaining witness who is putting money on his phone to tell him, call me. This is the same complaining witness saying, I love you back and forth. This is the same complaining witness that he shares a child with. I, I don't want any of this. I, these statements are vital to show exactly what, why she called the police to say she wants the charges dropped, why she didn't show up to the preliminary exam, and why she will not show up on the 21st. Because she, I don't want any of this. That's all I'm trying to show the court is... This is as clear as this is her own words. And it's in the jail. That I don't want any of this. And so none of that, none of that, you're indicating to the court, is prompted by the defendant's contact with her, the defendant's insistence to his mother or to the grandma that you need to contact her to change her story. None of that has any bearing on her whatsoever, Mr. Rinser. How can we say it does against him? How can you say it doesn't? I mean, if, if and I realize that it's by a preponderance of the evidence, but what I've got is I've got someone who makes a statement about putting your hands on someone. Right. Then all of a sudden I confront you with what they say you said. He basically is saying she doesn't want any of this. Well, that would be true for a lot of domestic violence victims that they don't want any of it. You probably don't want a whole lot of things. And that I didn't say any of it to Your Honor. Right. What she's supposed to say, Mr. Mentor. Why? See, Please. this is part of the problem here is your client shouldn't have been contacted here in the first place. Shouldn't have been contacted here in the first place and shouldn't have been trying to contact through third parties to then tell third parties to tell her something. And now when confronted with it, 
And he smart enough to realize I'm not going to say those things like don't show up, don't whatever. That's why the court has to listen to the context of everything that's going on that the court has to determine whether or not there's some intent on this defendant to stop this victim from testifying. So while you might draw that one conclusion, isn't it equally plausible that the opposite conclusion has to be drawn? Of course, absolutely. Absolutely, Your Honor. But I'm trying to persuade or show this court that it's not, you know, and if we look, if we look at people versus Burns, if we look at the fact pattern there, the facts in that fact pattern, the defendant tells the complaining witness not to tell, don't tell anyone or she will get in trouble. And the court in that case ruled that there was no specific intent for the uh, complaining witness to not be or to be unavailable for court. You know, they, they they were correct on element one. Was it wrongdoing? Yeah. Not to tell. Don't tell anyone or she will get in trouble. Yes, that's wrong. But you know, they, they ruled it, elements two and three. Specific intent to not show. It's a case-by-case -case basis. And it improperly assumes the defendant's knowledge. You know, that they not show? Had the defendant intended to have the complaining witness not show. But your but your whole argument on those points rests on the exact verbiage outside of context and outside of what may be the reality of what's going on. Does it not? It, it, it's yes, it's case by case basis, it's different facts, different things said. Different circumstances, absolutely. Was, you know, I want to point to the court that, you know, it. Why would he need her to change her story? Because if the police report. Why not just go up and say, okay, if that's not it, then you need to go to the hearing and you need to tell everybody that. Why not just say that? Well, Your Honor, he. This is a this is a fresh matter. He made the calls before his arraignment. Wanted to speak with uh, his. Why the pressure on her? Since you don't want to answer that question, why the pressure on her to through grandma pressure her to change her story? If I've had a conversation with you regarding you didn't do this, you didn't say this, you didn't do whatever. Why am I using a third party to also reinforce that? You know, I don't know what his phone minutes situation was at the time. Uh, I'm not. What's that mean? I don't know if he could reach her and find out, check the status on whether she did it or not. She, I don't know if she has transportation. I don't know if she has the, he probably doesn't know if she. That's not my question. My question is, why does he use a third party to also try to exude, exude at least as the court sees it, that pressure for her to change her story? If as you portray it, they're having this wonderful conversation and she's saying, no, basically, I didn't say all of that. They've all got it wrong. They've got it this. And that they come to some miracle understanding that she should then contact them to change her story. Why tell a third person they need to re to to basically reinforce that to her? Why do that? Thank you, Honor. Because. Mr. Kyle is sitting in jail and has no idea what's going on. And he would like to check the status on whether the statement has been corrected to Why a truth. Why didn't we just ask her? We did, Your Honor. But, but so you're, you're, you're not answering my question. Why do I use a third party to do that if I've had this meeting of the minds that you got it wrong to the police 
And so therefore, now you're going to call, you're going to make everything better by changing your story. If that's the case, why have somebody else have to reinforce that? If it's, you just need to tell the truth, why do I have to have somebody else call and say? Yeah, yeah, you're on That's, you know, it's a great, great question. And I will answer. I'd like a great answer. And my answer is, my answer is to check the status on whether she did or not. And mind, but he didn't ask the person check on whether or not she did. Ah, uh, your honor, I believe in one of the jail calls. Did you talk to Rachel? Did she manage to go up there along? Uh, you know, I'm paraphrasing this, but she needs to change her story. Operative words. Not because it's you need to tell her to change your story, basically. Because if she does not. Is that really checking on status, counsel? Your Honor, also. Is that really checking on status? I can't I can't tell you exactly why. You get your argument. Your argument to me is that he's checking on the status. Is that checking on the status to you? It can be, Your Honor, if he's. Seriously? That's checking on status? Did you talk to Rachel? Go ahead with the rest of your argument. All right, in regards to that as well, his grandma, his mother, all are in communications with Rachel. They, in, in regards to their child, they've said it many times in, to, in the jail calls. We are calling to check up on the child, to check up on the child. And there was statements in a lot of those jail calls where the mother herself, this is between you guys. All I care about is the baby. You know, so, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't give you a pinpoint answer on why he called the grandma to see uh, the status or, sorry, to ask if she's talked to Rachel, but all right, those are the circumstances. Anything else? Your Honor, I just want to harp on the fact that the language, the demeanor, and the motive behind those jail calls or in context of those jail calls was not to procure unavailability because not once did he say, don't show up. Not once did he say, lie. Okay, the motive was to co correctly testify. So I don't believe any of these elements are met, none, none of the three, due to those reasons. You know, if, he, if he was telling her, hey, you got to go up there and tell, and tell him I didn't do any of that. Tell him, tell him make, make something up, lie, don't show up. No. The jail causes, what did, you, what did you say when you got up there? That I didn't do anything. Okay. So you really think it has to be that direct? It's by a preponderance of the evidence. No, but do you think the examples that you give are certainly the most egregious of circumstances? My question to you is, does it, are you indicating to the court that it always has to be that direct, that there can't be context to what's being said? Your Honor, that is exactly what I'm saying. In our favor, though, the context 
of those statements. Does it have to be that direct? No, it could be many different ways. You know, we look at uh, People versus Jones. People versus Jones, in that case, there was uh, the facts where the defendant was in a, involved in a, in a gang and uh, the complaining witness didn't testify because of, you know, the repercussions of testifying in a gang or people versus Giles, where he made the defendant made the complaining witness unavailable. The complaining witness is she's available. She's available. She just does not want to proceed. She does not want to move forward. She said it. And so, no, it's not that direct. There's context to it. It's case by case basis. And if you look at everything that is going on, I, I don't know. I don't know where he said don't show up. I don't know where he said don't uh, lie. Hang on, counsel. That's precisely what I'm asking you. You keep coming back to that. And I'm asking, does it have to be that direct? You tell me it doesn't have to be, and then you proceed to argue that. So I'm unclear where you're coming from. Well, my question to you is, there are ways of telling people not to show up or placing them in a difficult position where they don't, which would be tantamount to saying don't show up. By way of example, if the court draws a conclusion that he's asking her to change the story, that she then calls, tries to change the story, but it doesn't change the posture of the people in proceeding. She's now caught because now she has to show up and lie or just not show up at all. And you don't think that one through that series of events could reasonably draw that that's what the defendant's intent was? That if it works, it's gone. I'm out. But if it doesn't work and they don't get rid of it, then you got to lie or you got to do whatever. I placed you into an impossible circumstance. Why wouldn't that be tantamount to causing the unavailability of the complainant and have reasonably been what he desired to occur? Your Honor, could it not be her own choice to not show up? Could it not be the fact that she does not want to proceed on this? And it could also be due to the fact that what was said was out of context. There was no indication of. If her choice is a voluntary one, then maybe. The problem that you have is you've got all of this, which would lead the court to the conclusion that if she doesn't show, that's not voluntary on her part. Your Honor, the court here has revoked Mr. Kyle's phone privileges. Because he violated bond. That's yes, yes. We're not we're not objecting to that, Your Honor. I just well, you can object all you want. He violated bond. You're 100 percent right. I know. Okay. So what's the point of this? Your Honor, the phone, his phone privileges were revoked on the 6th of April. The preliminary exam was on the 21st. She has had all that time, almost two weeks with no contact, nobody spoken to her to make the decision. Oh, no, 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 no. I, 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 that's I, not true. You're right. You're right. You're right. I know that's, that's absolutely untrue. I, his, so. his contact comes through a third party. Your Honor, I misspoke on that. I meant to say Mr. Kyle has had 
did not make any phone calls, obviously, because his phone privileges were revoked. However, Your Honor, I've said all I've needed to say in purposes of this argument, and I appreciate you taking the time and this court to allow me to make those arguments. Thank you. Anything else from the people? Court in reviewing that and listening, listen to the phone calls and giving context to those phone calls. Um, the standard here being a preponderance of the evidence. The court is of the opinion that um, the context made to, uh, let me say that, it would be, I guess, easier if defendants were just saying to victims, alleged victims, don't show up, don't testify, don't do that. If they use those exact words, these, these become simple analysis. Um, so that would be easy. Or, if quite frankly, defendants would abide by the bond condition of no contact then that would be easy because then if they don't show up, it has nothing to do with or couldn't, would not possibly have anything to do with what the defendant um, did. But none of these, or very few of them, I should say, are that direct. They go through other mechanisms by which to have the, um, the victims either not appear or change their story or in some way attempt to try to cause their unavailability. Clearly his contact and the statements made are wrongdoing on his part. The court believes by preponderance of the evidence that the statements made, the context upon which they're made, the further contact with the grandmother directed to um, say things or continue to say things, to reinforce things to this alleged victim. The court does believe that uh, by preponderance of the evidence that that was specifically intended to procure. Uh, either her false testimony or her unavailability should that not or could she not stomach making the false what may be considered false claims or changed claims um, the question as to whether or not is engaging in that um, wrongdoing and then the, whether or not it has caused, will cause the unavailability of this victim. It already has on one instance and um, or caused her to take a course that it did. It may indeed on the um, May 21st cause that to happen. It certainly did on April 23rd. This court's belief is having listened to everything. And so for those reasons, the court would grant the people's motion and that the statements, if they are otherwise admissible under the Michigan court rules regarding um, evidence of the alleged acts of domestic violence are will be admitted through the proper witness that typically being a police officer. So people's motion is great. Thank you. Thank you.